Well, I am Forbes resident healthcare writer from, as you New Yorkers say, out there in Chicago, where I've been uh, covering healthcare for 20 years, dating back to my native Iowa roots, where I covered the Clintons uh, bus ride through Iowa talking about healthcare. And the interesting thing in having written about this for 20 years is that even though politicians talk about coverage and we talk about providing more care to people, it is often missing three things. It's often not transparent, it's not convenient, and you never know what the cost is. So our panel here this afternoon is going to address what I think is one of the uh, more entrepreneurial efforts that actually started free of uh, Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement and it has been started based on people paying cash for services and now it's catching fire in the fact that it is going to be integrated into uh, the healthcare law through private sector efforts. So I think it's kind of fascinating. So I'm going to turn to our first uh, guest, who is Dr. Andy Sussman, who is, uh, he is the chief medical officer of CVS Caremark. And harking back to our Midwest theme, CVS's Minute Clinics started in Minneapolis. It was a, a private sector venture and has now grown into what is the nation's largest chain of retail health clinics. So, Dr. Sussman. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the Forbes organization for having the, the meeting today. Uh, I'd spend just a couple minutes talking about the challenges we face, to tell you a little bit about the Minute Clinic model, and then where we're going in the future. In terms of challenges, we face a profound shortage of primary care physicians, expected to reach 45,000 in 2020. We have an aging population and an epidemic of obesity causing chronic disease. And this forms the backdrop for the Affordable Care Act, now with millions of additional patients getting coverage. But of course, the simple problem is we do not have enough primary care physicians to meet all of these urgent medical needs. We greatly support the primary care physician medical home model, but in many of our markets, as many as half the patients we see do not have a physician. They are medically homeless. We provide them with lists of physicians taking new patients in their area for follow-up. We think the Minute Clinic model can help in a complementary and supportive way of the traditional healthcare system to provide for care. Now, many patients today are thinking of themselves both as patients and consumers who are looking for affordable, accessible, and high quality care. Minute Clinic operates 740 clinics in 27 states and in the District of Columbia. We've added 300 clinics in the last three years alone. We've seen over 17 million patients, 10 million in the last three years. Our model of walk-in care seven days a week without appointment is well received by patients. We use nurse practitioners who use evidence-based guidelines for all the care that we deliver. We provide acute services for sore throat, earache, sinus infection, vaccinations, uh, and increasingly blood pressure checks, diabetes checks. We send all of that information to the patient's physician if they have one. Uh, over 80% of patients use some kind of third-party coverage, as you point out. Uh, we take 200 commercial plans, Medicare, Medicaid. We're participating in many of the health care exchanges. But even for uninsured and for the growing population of patients on high deductible plans, our prices are transparent, they're posted in our clinics, and they are low. In terms of quality, we feel passionately about quality. We're accredited by the Joint Commission, so we meet the high standards of the Joint Commission, the certifying body uh, of healthcare organizations around the country. And a RAND-sponsored study demonstrated that our care was equivalent in quality to care delivered in a physician office, emergency room, or urgent care site for the kind of patients that we see, and 40 to 80 percent less expensive. And if you think about where we are in our national discourse on health care and the problems we face, having care that's easily accessible, evidence-based and high quality, and low cost is really the heart of the matter. Now, um, we have worked with the medical societies to make sure we honor a variety of principles. All care at Minute Clinics on an electronic medical record, that's a national record that's coordinated. If patients don't have a physician, we give a list of physicians taking new patients. We have a well-defined scope of services. 
and we use evidence-based guidelines for all the care that we uh, deliver. For the future, we anticipate getting to 1,500 clinics in 2017. Just this week, we opened markets in Hawaii and Louisiana, and we'll very shortly in Northern California and New Hampshire. So continued growth of clinics. We're expanding our scope. Now, no one's gonna get an appendectomy in the back of a CVS, unless we get more space. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we can add preventative services like weight loss visits and other kinds of uh, co coaching and counseling visits, which will help with a number of chronic health problems. And we've affiliated with 30 major health systems across the country, places like the Cleveland Clinic, UCLA, Emory, Advocate, North Shore, and many, many others, having their doctors collaborate with our nurse practitioners, integrating our electronic records with theirs. So in Northern Ohio, our notes go to the EMR of the Cleveland Clinic, and some of their information is available in our clinics, and working together to take care of chronic disease patients. Our principles are around using evidence-based care whenever it's available, having providers practice at the maximum ability of their license, which will be the most efficient system, and sharing clinical information in a secure and appropriate manner. We've cared for millions of patients in an affordable, high quality, and accessible way, and we're very proud of that. And I look forward to the comments of my uh, other panelists. If I could ask uh, Dr. Sussman a quick question. What do you think is, you know, you mentioned the appendectomies in the back of the CVS. What, is there anything that the, these clinics are doing now that, that are do, not doing now that you think they'll be doing, and there also is a little, doctors get a little nervous about that, because um, you might be encroaching on their terms. What, what, where do you see, what's the limit of these? Yeah, well let me just say on the physician side, we work closely with physicians. All of our providers have a collaborating physician who does chart review, who does educational sessions, and we think that's an important part of the model, whether it's required uh, in a particular region or not and we send the records to physicians, we send patients to physicians because we're not gonna provide their full care. We would like to be part of the team of providers as part of the primary care medical home. Now as to where things can go, I think there is more opportunity on the coaching and counseling, some of the chronic disease activities, but as part of the treatment team collaborating, using electronic clinical information and the integration of that information to establish a virtual medical home, one that makes best use of our resources and allows for the best possible care. And in the long run, I think telehealth will add another set of opportunities to bring physicians directly into our model seeing patients. Okay, thanks. Now we're gonna increase the acuity a little bit here. Um, and we're gonna go to our next panelist, uh, Traver Hutchins, who is the uh, CEO of ASAP Urgent Care, and he's going to tell you about how urgent care is a uh, step above in a, in a, gets physicians more involved in a, a sort of a higher level care than the retail clinics, which is exploding across the country. And I think personally, I think part of the response from the physicians to the retail clinic boom has been urgent care. So if you could tell us a little about what, what you're doing at ASAP. <clears throat> so first of all, ASAP is really, it's an urgent care rollout chain uh, focused in New England. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at New England in terms of urgent care per 100,000 population, it's way underserved relative to a, a majority of the country. <clears throat> urgent care overall has, has really exploded uh, it, to put it in perspective, the retail industry, retail clinic industry is at 1,500 or 2,000 maybe in that area. <clears throat> Urgent care is at 9,000 and scheduled to be uh, 12,000 centers uh, by 2017 uh, with about $18 billion in revenue. So it's big business. It's, uh, it's been going on for some time in terms of the differentiation between retail and urgent care moving up the acuity level. We, the easy way to think about it is in a, in a minute clinic or um, take care or what have you, uh, they you have a wonderful scope of care. And urgent care does essentially all of those things and then some. So if you, it's, like, it's like minute clinic plus, uh, where you have a, a doctor leading the care. Uh, in our case, it's a blended model, so you'll have a doctor and then a nurse practitioners. Get an x-ray. We have x-rays. We do extensive lab work, so if somebody comes in with what we suspect is a broken ankle, we'll do the x-ray right there, we'll do the uh, teleradiology right there, give them the read, 
put a boot on it and send them right over to Dr. Rothman who will take care of it from there on in. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's urgent care in a nutshell has really uh, exploded. And I think earlier today I was struck by a comment. We all know that um, you know, universal care has, you know, it's a noble thing, it's, it's the right thing to do. But when you look at Massachusetts, and we heard about it this morning, what, what happened as a side effect was that the ER actually moved up in terms of its activity levels. And, and I think that that's an unfortunate side effect that we can expect nationwide. And that's just quite simply because of all the volume. If, if you think there's a lot of pressure to see your doctor right now, you haven't seen anything yet. And, and so as we all push rightly to try to see our doctor, we're not all going to be able to do that. And that's why other uh, alternatives such as urgent care or a retail clinic makes, makes a lot of sense. I want to add that uh, I think you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurism. Uh, certainly we look at that with our company in terms of how do you deliver care. Uh, we think of them as patients uh, that are really customers. So uh, kind, of, kind of the way Howard Schultz would look at a customer or Steve Jobs would look at a customer. That's the way that we think healthcare really is today, that consumerism taken to its logical end is that this is a customer who is increasingly paying their own money and they damn well better get what they want. So it's not only transparency, but it's, it's accessibility. You know, I want it now and I want it, I want great results from a competent doctor and, and I want it in the, in the way that I want to be served. And, and so in our case, that's right out of the gate, telehealth as well. I'll tell you, telehealth isn't as accretive to us as somebody walking into the clinic, but that's not the point. The point is to serve them as they want to be served. And, you know, longer term to really look at these as relationships, not to encroach on the, the you know, the primary care physician because ultimately that should be their overall head coach. You know, but we're there to, when they can't see their doctor, uh, we will send the, you know, the EMR right over the electronic medical record, I should say, right back to the doctor and so forth. So we really see that as a collaborative e ecosystem, if you will, uh, between uh, you know, putting the right care at the right time for the person at the least possible cost. Well, I'm going to move on then to Dr. Rothman, who is a noted orthopedic surgeon and uh, founder of the Rothman Institute at uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, Medical Center in Philadelphia. And it's, it's interesting that Dr. Rothman is going to tell you about the, the, the move, the urgent care move into more specialized areas, which, no offense to the esteemed academic medical centers out there, but academic medical centers provide great care, but they're often not known for convenience. They might be more known for uh, great care and a, you know, $50 an hour parking garage fee or something. <laughs> if you could talk to us a little bit about what you're doing at, in urgent care. Bruce, uh, thanks for uh, lobbing that softball right up to me and setting this up. Um, you know, we're undergoing, as everybody in the room knows, a paradigm shift. 20 years ago, if you were chairman of a uh, academic department, which is my background, your job assignment was pretty simple give good patient care, do a lot of research and teaching, and that was it. Society would take care of you, the university health systems were uh, prosperous, and it was easy. But things have changed. Uh, people expect different things from us. They expect uh, affordability and uh, cost control, and that's probably at the top of the pyramid. Quality is still there, that's uh, shifted uh, down, and accessibility and convenience has been uh, brought out is tremendously important. And you know, Darwin was right, it's not the uh, biggest that will survive, it's not the brightest, it's the most adaptable. And frankly, I worry about the jewel in the crown of the health system, which is the academic medical center, may become extinct if it doesn't respond because they are expensive, they are inaccessible, they are cumbersome, and they're slow to respond. We're a corporate model. Uh, we're, uh, our region is the Delaware Valley. We have 20 clinics. And so we've added to that original paradigm 
a very cost-effective model, and if there are one or two words how to sum it up in terms of understanding our success, and we have a very, very high penetration if you drew that 90-mile radius around Philadelphia. One of the phrases is, go to the patient. Don't expect them to drive into the middle of the city, pay $50 for parking, uh, have all the hostility of a big city environment, wait two hours, pay $1,500 for your emergency room visit. I mean, that's history. And if uh, the medical centers don't go to the patient, open clinics in their community, make it a five-minute drive, uh, and make it affordable, they're going to be out of business. So our model embraces going out to the community. That's fundamental, not building the ivory tower at the medical center. We want to make it right in your neighborhood, free parking, uh, easy access, no appointment. You walk in with a musculoskeletal injury, you get your x-ray, your physician, and your cast uh, as needed right away. The time, our time expectation is 45 minutes for that encounter compared to a waiting room, emergency room, where it's four hours. The cost, you go to a, most emergency rooms with a twisted ankle, get the x-ray, $1,500 and four hours. Uh, our cost will be $400. We'll still be making a profit. The insurer's happy, we're happy, the patient's happy. And I think the specialty urgent care clinic is the uh, uh, wave of the future. And if academic medical centers don't respond, they're going to be like the dinosaurs. I don't see many dinosaurs on A Street anymore. <laughs> and uh, if, if we don't respond to the, the simple expectations of affordable care, um, we're going to be out of business. And the one word, my last word, will be, uh, and I try to make things really simple to understanding our success, uh, one was going to the patient, move out to the community. The second, and I haven't heard this word yet today, is compassionate care. And our leaders uh, today of our uh, corporate entity, Mike and Todd, if people aren't compassionate, they don't work with us. And people need to be loved and cared for in a compassionate way. And I think that word is lost today. And it's unfortunate because it's part of the healing process. It's what patients sense and what has led to our success. That what we do, we do well, but we do it with compassion. Um, Dr. Rothman, if we, I could ask you one quick question. H how are you going to get these academic physicians on board? I mean, they, it, it, is it been, how has it been in your organization? The uh, psychology of the academic physician um, hasn't lent itself to quick decision making, <laughs> to, um, to say the least. It hasn't lent itself to a no margin, no mission philosophy. It was actually, somebody mentioned that phrase. It's Sister Irene Krauss who said that, so I like to turn to the Vatican for authenticity. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I think today's world, there's not enough money to do everything, so you have to be solvent and make a profit to do our good work. Hard to get that, uh, Bruce. <coughs> um, I'm going to go over to uh, question and answer in just a moment. But uh, before I do that, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Waugh, who is the president-elect of the American Medical Association. And he's also the global chief medical officer of Computer Sciences Corporation. And I've covered many AMA meetings. So I want to turn it to you to throw a wet blanket on all of this. No, I'm just kidding. So, what I want you to talk to us about some of the concerns that organized medicine has had about these, either the retail clinics or the urgent care centers, and they've also kind of come around to the concept. If you could talk a little bit about that. Well, thank you, Bruce. Um, 
I guess I'm the last here and referred to, and every time he said dinosaur, he looked at me, so I'm not sure <laughs> how that exactly was supposed to fit. Um, I think most of you know the American Medical Association has been around for 165 plus years. We're the umbrella organization for all physicians. We represent physicians regardless of their geography, what state they're from, what specialty they're from, what mode of practice they practice in, or what career stage they're in. We're really unique in that regard that we are the umbrella organization representing all physicians. So I'm here not to throw a wet blanket on anything. I'm not here to represent the dinosaurs. I'm not here to represent the academic physicians more than anybody else. I'm here, I hope, to represent all physicians in the country uh, because I think that's what we do as the American Medical Association. But I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about this, I think, as an exciting addition to our healthcare delivery system. And I, I see these various permutations, whether it be uh, an urgent care clinic, a minute clinic, or a specialty care clinic, as another addition to our delivery system in this country. And as a physician, I'm all about trying to figure out the best way to deliver good care for my patients. And I, I would support 100% that. I think my organization would as well. What we do talk about at the American Medical Association, and we've written a couple of reports on it, is as these new entities come up, there are some principles that we hope people will subscribe to. And I was very pleased to hear Dr. Sussman talk about they have seen those guidelines and they do in fact follow them. So I, I you know. Give us an example of a couple of things that are on those guidelines. So some of them are that, um, they're, they're very common sense. There's nothing magical about them. We think that if somebody is going to stand up another entity to take care of patients, that it be consistent and integrated in the fabric of our ecosystem that takes care of patients. It not be out there freestanding on its own, isolated on a little island. So the so, nurse practitioner works with the physician. Right. right, so as he said, they're supervised by physicians, their charts are reviewed, they're co they have a direct consultation path. We don't want our patients going in with an expectation that they can have everything done at a CVS only to find out that there's a hard limit. He talked about an appendectomy, that may, I think he's joking about that, but you know, uh, I stopped watching ER on TV when they did a C-section in the ER, so I, you know, there's, there's a limit to what I think a facility can do, and I think there's a reasonable limit what a, what a facility can do, and we shouldn't try to exceed that. So, you know, we're also trying to make sure that there is, in fact, connectivity with a primary care physician, because we know as physicians that care is best when it's orchestrated by somebody who's going to have some continuity with the patient. All of these places have sort of a one-off event with a patient that doesn't tend to lend itself to continuity. Now, I understand the other, I'm primarily talking about the minute clinics, because you know, you go in on Saturday, if you come back on Tuesday, it's very likely the same person is not there to see you again. And so the continuity is not there, and so we worry about that. Because with continuity, you have a holistic view of the patient. When it's episodic, you tend to see just what you see during that episode. Um, so those are examples of mm. some of the guidelines that we put out there. And I, like I said, I think they're very common sense guidelines. Nobody would think that they're particularly unusual or restrictive. And like I said, I'm very pleased to hear that they're being uh, uh, followed. Um, the fact that medical records and information flows from the whatever entity it is into the primary care physician's record is good. I do uh, believe that you know when you when there's talk about chronic care being done in a minute clinic or an episodic kind of clinic, I think they can be an adjunct to chronic care, but they probably can't be the orchestrator of the chronic care. Going back to the continuity part, I think there's a there's a, just a strong belief that you can't provide continuity in that kind of environment. So, you know, and, and I would say also, I think I heard something about compassion. I think all physicians are interested in being compassionate caregivers to our patients. I don't think any one clinic or any one setting has a corner on the market in compassion. I'd like to believe we're all seeking to do that regardless of where we're delivering that care. So I want to be sure that we're, we're clear about that. Nobody's less compassionate or wants to be less compassionate depending on the setting they're in. I do agree with some of the, what I call infrastructure issues that we have in healthcare today. And I think that's a challenge we all have to face. Um, I've been involved in large medical institutions and small clinics and there are differences just because of the scope and scale of what you're dealing with sometimes. Uh, some of those infrastructure things that are very important to patients don't get as high on priority of the institution, parking being one of them. So, you know, I've been in institutions where we've talked about we need to start valet parking just like they do at the mall. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Speaking of um, valet parking, did any of you park valet? I, wanna, <laughs> I want to open it up to some questions to the patients out there. 
and I'm sure there's some positions as well. If we could, ta why don't we try the upper deck? How about, we got. Hi, my name's Alex Bender. I'm with Visiting Physician Services. I'm just curious, there's two distinct models, right? One is fully vertically integrated model, uh, this large healthcare system, versus what we're hearing here is what they would call focused factories, okay? Where you can do it faster, quicker, cheaper, and better in many cases. Will one model win out over the other? Um, or are they both gonna be able to operate uh, and coexist? You wanna take that one, Doctor? Doctor Sure. Robert? I think both are gonna win because if you look at where the dollars are spent, a huge uh, cost is the high technology surgery for heart, cancer, and musculoskeletal. And the savings can be immense. And it was Professor Hertzlinger at Harvard who said, focused factories of excellence. Uh, let me give you an example. To get your cataract done in the United States per eye is about $5,000 if you figure in the part, the surgeon, and the hospital. Um, a colleague of mine in New Delhi has built an eye hospital. They're delivering a good product for $50. So it's 1% of the cost of the United States, and they're making money. This is a for-profit, entrepreneurial-driven system. So what we think is disruptive, we haven't seen disruption yet. And we're trying to do it like with physical therapy. Uh, in a factory of excellence. Uh, uh, costs for, we do, there are a lot of hip replacements done in the United States, uh, probably 500,000 a year, very expensive to the government. And a third of the cost is after discharge, as Mike has uh, taught me. And that may be $6,000 investment in physical therapy after discharge. We're developing an internet-based system um, where you sign on the internet, a good-looking therapist teaches you how to do your exercise, you measure the compliance, $2 compared to $6,000. So we're just now, uh, as Patrick has alluded earlier, getting into the disruption that will benefit everybody. Thank you. I'll just Go follow ahead. on the the, uh, the factories. Uh, that uh, that analogy is actually you know. You guys don't look like factory no, but workers. No, actually, by the way. It, I use that in a positive sense because it does allow the the entry point, the lowest level of acuity, you know, all of that stuff that is clogging the doctor's day. <clears throat> you know, the the PCP who is trained to do a whole scope of care. You know, the doctor is now allowed to maybe spend if they can see thirty patients a day, see more complex cases and let urgent care minute clinics handle the less complex cases and I think that that really will help the system of healthcare overall nationwide flow better and take some of that pressure off the ER that right now is the backup plan even if you have a, a bad cold. So I think uh, you know a, a factory with integrated direct integration uh, you know the Ford methodology of having you know minute clinics to urgent care to the primary care can work very well, and I, and I would also add, I know you're doing some things in this area with in terms of being uh, part of the ACO environment. You know, uh, who could be who could be more efficient than an urgent care operator or a, a retail clinic for that that low level acuity activity of managing a patient? Why why send them to the the most expensive part of the healthcare system? Well, some uh, some would say though, and I wonder if you guys could address this, and then we'll take another question. Is that that these thing, these efforts could add to costs if it's not coordinated, and it are and are we further fragmenting the system if we're popping up more clinics and s urgent care centers if if they're not all hooked into an academic medical center another system, aren't we going to add to costs if people don't know where people are coming from and going? But if a third of the problem is musculoskeletal, by and large, pain, back, ankle, knee. And we assure that patient that he's going to get into the continuity of high-quality branded care 
if we see them right away, no waiting in their community, part of our algorithm is they get to the appropriate subspecialist immediately or at the appropriate time, two days a week for follow-up care. We keep them out of the emergency room and out of the readmission process. Uh, questions? I would just make one. Another in the upper deck. <laughs> you give him a microphone. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a, a simple uh, question here. Uh, how would one go about breaking the stranglehold of the medical industrial complex in terms of uh, the charges? For example, uh, hardware on the on, on the hip uh, it costs uh, less than one third, in, even in Europe, uh, uh, versus uh, in this country, and a uh, hundred dollar uh, 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 a toilet paper, uh, uh, things like that. That that could be broken pretty easily, I think. Well, I, I'm <laughs> okay, Doctor, you want to take that, Doctor sure, Sussman? Sure, sure. I mean, I I won't take the specific uh, items you mentioned, but I will take the concept, which is that it's really imperative at this point that we think about things differently. Mr. Forbes mentioned that yesterday. Uh, there is a tremendous opportunity to be creative and, in some ways, disruptive with the way we think about healthcare. At Minute Clinic, we use a self-service kiosk to check in millions of patients, taking. Uh, front desk person out of our model and lowering our costs. We use evidence-based guidelines so that the same care in California is the same care as in Connecticut. And if patients fall off those guidelines, we send them to a higher level of care. And that's allowed us to drive down prices in a way that uh, makes us an attractive site of care. So I think we have to use technology in a wise way. We have to think about who's providing the care and have people practicing at the maximum ability of their license and try to find those opportunities where standardization makes sense. It makes sense when someone has a routine condition that they get the care that the best evidence would suggest. Now, certainly, that doesn't mean every patient will fit that model. And when they don't, they need to be referred to a higher level of care. But when they do, we should treat people the way the evidence should suggest. That'll produce the best outcome for the patient and at the lowest cost. And I think those opportunities abound in medicine, both the ability to bring new technology to the fore in a very helpful way to patients, to use the right level of provider, and to use standardization when it's appropriate uh, to get us to the very best possible outcomes. Dr. Rothman, you had an add something? Yeah, I think the question was directed the cost of, for instance, implants that may vary tenfold. From Everybody's got to have their own in orthopedic surgery, right? Right. <laughs> custom designed implants. And uh, my experience working in private equity with the Riverside Company is that the world's flat and companies are transparent now in the pricing. I think that problem of uh, disparate pricing with the world integration and uh, manufacturing and sales is going to correct itself. Question over here. Hi, thanks. This is actually a little bit of a follow-on to the, the question above. Um, I, I think of you guys as a, uh, a closer to community access point in a lot of ways, right? Like you are a lot closer to, to, to those of us out there in the real world. Um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about some of the ways that you are um, you know, what are some of the new ways you're thinking about patient engagement? How are you using the model that you, that you have now to uh, instill a greater sense of responsibility or accountability or give back some of the power to the, the consumer, the patient? Um, what are some ways you're, you're, you're working with that? What are you seeing work? I, Dr. Rao. I think education and using modern technology to better educate our patients, very powerful tools. So whether it's nutritional counseling and making patients more responsible for their weight, uh, abstinence from smoking, uh, getting active, if nothing else, uh, is really based on committing time, energy, and money to education of our patients. And some areas we're more successful than others. I'd say I agree on education. That's a very important part of the uh, Minute Clinic experience. And at the end of the visit, we spend a fair amount of time educating the patients. We have 
very high engagement and net promoter scores up there with some of the best known brands by really working on that aspect and nurse practitioners are well schooled in doing that. With some of the work we're thinking about in telemedicine, we actually get a chance to show the patient the findings. They can see the inside of their ear or the inside of their throat and say, you see that redness, that's what the problem is. We need to make sure you adhere to your medications as we go through this cycle of treatment. So I think there are some nice opportunities going forward to share clinical information with patients in a reasonable way that makes them engaged and adhere to the uh, treatment regimen. Dr. Wather, can you respond to that? And also, a lot of people that go to urgent care and retail clinics don't have a primary care physician. Can you address yeah, so that? I'll, I'll try to encapsulate the response to a couple things that have been said. I, I, I want to say again, though, that all these are great. Engaging the consumer patient is something we're all doing in medicine. And again, I don't think anybody has a corner on that market. It's not only happening in one venue. It's happening in all of it. So I just want to be clear that it's not like you can't go to a non-minute clinic and have somebody show you your ear or your throat, or you can't get you know, good education or follow-up in another venue. That's all I want to say about that. I think they're all great venues to do it. I just want to make sure it's not like one venue only. To the point about the cost of care, I think it is one point I want to bring up is making sure that however we do these new delivery entities in our system, that they're not somehow cherry-picking patients off the list and only taking care of those who have cash or who are willing to pay higher rates because all of us have an obligation to take care of our patients in this country. And so, you know, I've heard stories where certain payers like Medicaid, which are usually not the best payers, are not accepted in some of these entities, which then puts the burden on the rest of the system to take care of the Medicaid patients because some entities will refuse to take care of them. So I just put that out there as another issue that's worth considering to make sure there's equity across the playing field and that all entities have a responsibility to take care of patients. And so I wanted to be sure about that as well as the fact that not everybody is doing it only in one place. T totally no, no, agree. I'm going to take another question. Uh, we have another one up there. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, Mr. Sussman, there, the reason why the clinics are growing um, and urgent care clinics are growing is because there's a problem. Patients cannot see their primary care physicians in a timely way. Um, and as an internist, that's frustrating for both me and my patients. Um, I think that rather than having, I'm sorry, kind of band-aids on the, the, the solution, I think what Kaiser is doing is very enviable in that we're trying to move towards having an internist. Are you with schedule. Kaiser? Yes, okay. yes. Half of my clinics uh, with my usual patients and have slots, half of them be open for walk-in uh, walk patients. Um, and I, 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 I think that we should still be very mindful of the fact that the best care is between a patient and his or her primary care physician because then we can see the patient for a long time and we know what's going on. Um, even if it, it is just a simple cold. Yeah, I, may I respond? I, I mean, sure. I'm a primary care physician myself, and I, I totally agree with you. I think around the country, we see a large number of patients who don't even have a physician to get into the practice. And that problem is going to get worse. It takes a decade to educate a new physician. So this problem of not having enough physicians is only really beginning. Over the next decade, it will intensify. Massachusetts, you heard earlier this morning what happened in Massachusetts, that emergency room visits went up. Massachusetts has the highest number of primary care physicians per capita in the country. There are states in our country that have more uninsured people than live in Massachusetts. So we have to face a system then where we have a team of providers, where perhaps we do a throat culture on a patient on a Sunday, send you that record, and when they follow up with you and we send them back to you, the care is coordinated and they keep, uh, you know, they keep up their care with you. We have no intention to replace the role of the primary care physician-led medical home, but we definitely see a lot of patients who are looking for care because there's not enough resource for them, and we can be part of the team helping to provide some of that care in a collaborative way. And I totally agree. We have no monopoly on engagement. I think we certainly share the desire to be part of that team taking care of patients. Question right there. So I'm John Watson with Covance. Dr. Watt, I had a question just about the 
pipeline of physicians. Given everything we've talked about today, there's a lot of pressure on healthcare, pressure on physicians, a lot of change. How, how is the pipeline of new and upcoming physicians and what is the motivation to be a physician now in the environment we're staring at in the not too distant future? Simple yes or no question, no problem. So um, <laughs> let's talk about pipeline real quickly. So as was already mentioned, it takes 10 years or longer to produce a practicing physician. So it's not an easy dial that you can just crank up and suddenly the output is there. I will tell you, I'll use this as an opportunity to tell you that one of the things we're concerned about at the AMA is not just medical students graduating, but where do they go after they graduate? They go into graduate medical education, which is residency fellowships, where they get their specialty training. And we're very concerned that in the past, we've always had more GME graduate medical education slots than we did graduates. But that, that gap between the number of people who are graduating and the number of slots we have to train them is narrowing to the point where we're very concerned that in some, some areas and some specialties, there's not enough places. So imagine graduating from medical school and you can't get a training spot to do your specialty. That would be a huge tragedy, we believe. And so there's a whole website, savegme.org, that we're trying to make the case for society on why graduate medical education is more than just training doctors. It also provides $8 billion a year of charity care in the United States today. So we're not just training doctors, but we're also providing care through GME. So we are concerned about that. Medical students or young physicians are very concerned about making sure they continue to have the opportunity to practice the specialty they want in the area they want. To your other question about what do we say to young people today to entice them into the specialty? I think that was a little bit of what you were referring to. You know, I've had the opportunity to speak to many, many young folks, and I'm continually, I guess, gratified that some of our best and brightest still are interested in a career in medicine. I would, I'd like to think that that's going to continue, but I am worried that all of the talk that we hear about the pressures that physicians are under, the terrible uh, circumstances that anecdotally get listed, will sway people from going into medicine. I personally think medicine is one of the most satisfying careers a person can have. We have a unique opportunity to take care of people, as was noted before, that doctor-physician relationship, I'm sorry, patient-physician relationship is one that's just unique in all society. So and I, I tell people about that, and, and people that recognize that value that, and they also recognize that it's a rewarding career financially and just professionally. They get a professional satisfaction at it in terms of uh, what they can just look at themselves in the mirror in the morning. So I haven't seen a big decline in that, but I do worry that as the, when we hear all this talk about all the challenges that we're facing in medicine today, that it will start to drive the best and the brightest away from medicine, and I think and that would be a, a huge quick, problem. A quick 411 on that. Um, there are all sorts of medical schools opening across the country, including in New York, Quinnipiac is opening a new medical school. However, to fund the graduate medical education, it's funded by Medicare, which you would need some kind of reform in Congress where we know they couldn't put together a two-car funeral. One more question over here. Uh, Chuck Denham, uh, the area of innovation, I'd like to just ask a question about two gaps that exist that are huge. Uh, one is in the primary care area, and the other is the largest group of caregivers in the world who have no training whatsoever are the home caregiver and they're carrying there are 91 million people in America multiple studies show that they're caring for children that are ill or their uh, elders or family members that are ill had have no training whatsoever so love to hear the panel react to how we're going to meet the need of training them we know that it's wound care we know that it's special diets we know that it's medication management thousand prescriptions are written, only 600 get filled. One in four of those that get filled, uh, they have an adverse drug event, half are taken improperly. That's one. And then the primary care is the second gap, and that is that the studies have shown in our areas, patient safety and innovation, that if you take a typical primary care doctor, a panel would be 2,500 patients. If they had to do acute care, chronic care, and preventative care, they'd have to work between 18 and 21 hours a day, and they work an average of 8.3 hours a day. You get so, question, we're running out of time. So that's the, prim the primary piece, and then the others are caregivers. Go ahead, Dr. Rothman. The answer wrap will be up. shorter than the question. <laughs> I think we have to be disruptive and use people like nurse practitioners, uh, professional assistants, who are very skillful, very compassionate, and much lower cost than physicians uh, to deliver health care for a variety of uh, less than complex issues. 
And I think worldwide that's going to be done in North Africa, Afghanistan, Pakistan. We're way behind uh, in that use of uh, less expensive personnel than physicians. We're very, very uh, much in our group uh, positive about the use of nurse practitioners. Yeah, I, yeah, I think political. we all agree that team-based care is the way to go, and the members of that team are vast. And so you're right, though, there's an unidentified part of the team, and that's the workers that are in the home, often family members. So I think that is an important part. But I think it's also important to look at the entire system as an entire ecosystem and not in isolation. And that's why I try to point that out, that all of these are really innovations, and innovations will, in fact, drive change in the organization, the grander organization. So the point that was made earlier that there's open clinic appointments now in many systems, I would submit that was probably driven by the fact that there was a minute clinic down the street that forced them to reconsider how they're working out their schedule. So I think innovation will move across the organization. It will be driven by disruptors like this, and I think that's fine. I think that's right. a healthy thing. I'd be, I'd be worried if the organization didn't function. Well, with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Dr. Wah with the American Medical Association, Dr. Sussman with CVS, Dr. Rothman with the Rothman Institute. Thank you very very much. And Dr. Hutchins with ASAP Urgent Care.